We are less than an hour away from going into day four without a Speaker of the House. Kevin McCarthy's bid for the speakership has now been defeated a total of 11 times in a row in just the past three days. The House adjourned just a few hours ago and will come back into session at noon tomorrow. McCarthy has now made several concessions to the group now known as Never Kevin Republicans who are dead set against seeing him with the gavel. But tonight we are hearing there is a potential deal in the works and Kevin McCarthy seems to think he's getting closer to his goal. Maybe. Have you seen any drugs? Who else can get to 200 bucks? If you're going, maybe somebody else can get to 218. That's the point. Who? I don't know. Scleef. We put a lot of names up. Scleef. I don't know. He hasn't put up. Could he get 218? Maybe, maybe Perez. Maybe Perez could. To what? To win. But at what point? How many more votes? How many more votes? Until we win. Did you come to any sort of agreement? You feel better today than you did? Yeah. I feel, I feel good today. Really. I felt I felt very positive yesterday. I feel more positive today. I think we had really good discussions. I think it really come to a really good point. I think. Did you close good. it though? We'll see. Confidence is key, I guess. Let's get straight to the news on Capitol Hill with my dear friend and correspondent, Ali Vitali. Ali, I have not seen you in ages. You are working. I, know, I miss you. Around, I miss you. <laughs> you are working around the clock. I. I I almost don't even want to ask because it's like, I'll believe it when I see it. But give me the latest on this possible deal. Yeah, Steph, a member said as they were leaving tonight, the sun will come up tomorrow. But the question is if McCarthy will be speaker when the sun comes up again, because they're going to be back here on the floor at noon. And they're on a time crunch because a lot of members have commitments over the weekend and they are playing a tight numbers game. I will say Kevin McCarthy was more upbeat tonight than we have seen him over the course of the past week. And as I've been talking to my sources here and we've been chasing members as they close up shop on this very lengthy meeting that really went on all all day here behind closed doors. The vibe is much more positive than I have seen it, so much so that one member and some well-placed sources who are familiar with these discussions say that they think that they're close to locking up 14 or 15 yes votes. These folks who have been part of these meetings that are actually operating in good faith, trying to make moves on things like key procedural rules, making moves on who they're putting on these kinds of committees, all of these important concessions that they've been negotiating all day, they do think that they could be one or two votes away from potentially getting there on the floor tomorrow. The caveat is they still have between four and six holdouts that don't seem like they're moving away from being never Kevin McCarthy anytime soon. So if the math isn't mathing for you, Steph, it's not mathing for me either, because you still can't get there if you're Kevin McCarthy at 215 or 216, unless some of these hard no votes just simply turn to present votes, and then your threshold starts shifting. We'll see if that's what happens when they get back on the floor tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Kevin McCarthy putting a smile on his face, saying he feels positive in the hallway, doesn't mean anything. Because when they are sitting there counting the votes, he didn't have them 11 times. This is one thing I really want to know, though. So he's making these concessions for some of the holdouts. Clearly, he didn't want to make these concessions days ago or weeks ago. How is this playing with moderate Republicans who have been voting with him in the beginning? They can't feel very good about what he's given up now. Yeah, he didn't want to make these concessions even over the summer when they first started these conversations with Freedom Caucus members. I'll put up for you, for example, on the screen, some of the things that we're talking about here because they're important, not just to the way that the first one there is, I think, the most important item on the list, which is the one member threshold to vacate the chair, basically to fire Kevin McCarthy from the speakership. He made a concession early on that five members could trigger that. Now they've gotten him down to one, which means that a lot of days could look like the last week once Kevin McCarthy and if Kevin McCarthy actually gets this job. The rest of them are really important for how the House works, how they do spending bills, and what actually ends up making it to the floor. Because the more House Freedom Caucus members that you put on the Rules Committee, think of that as the committee that's the clearinghouse. 
for everything that goes to the House floor. They have to do a vote out of the Rules Committee before anyone in the full body gets to vote on it. That's a really important concession here, and one that for conservatives who want to see curb spending, who might not want to negotiate on things like the debt ceiling and government funding, it's really important to see who they end up putting in those slots now that they've negotiated that more Freedom Caucus members are going to be there. Throughout this process, though, moderates have been kept well apprised. They are aware that they are doing a very caref careful balancing act. But I think one of the things that's keeping everybody on board is what Kevin McCarthy said when he left, which is, who else can get as many votes as he can? And right now, there is no clear answer to that. And so people are sticking with him. We are just minutes away from the two-year anniversary of the January 6th attack. And of the 20 Republicans who are currently holding up the speaker vote, it's important to note that 14 of them voted to overturn the results of the 2020 election. And as the House remains in gridlock on the anniversary of January 6th, The Washington Post is reporting that the Capitol tour guides have now been told only to mention the attack on the Capitol when they're asked. The Post points out, quote, it's a policy that in many ways reflects a country at odds with itself, unable to agree on fact and truth. With us for more, an American hero, former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sund. His new book, released this week, is Courage Under Fire, Under Siege and Outnumbered, 58 to 1 on January 6th. Stephen, I am grateful that you're here tonight. I'm grateful for all the work that you've done for our country. I have to ask... How difficult was it for you to write this book, every word reliving theoretically the most awful day of your life? It was, uh, it was extremely difficult. You know, as I sit there and I think about when I was writing it, I was thinking about every single one of my officers and how much they went through that day. And it, and it addresses not only January 6th, it addresses the days up to it at the 2020 uh, protests. But when I think about that day and what my men and women went through and what I saw, I had officers who had, were beaten, were knocked unconscious had a two by four torn from the inaugural platform with nails sticking out of it and hitting the head. It, it was brutal what, what I saw and what they went through and they shouldn't have had to go through that. I think there was so many failures that led to it, but we shouldn't be here today. I shouldn't have had to write that book. It was very difficult to write, but I couldn't be prouder of the men and women of the police department, all the police departments that came and helped us. Um, I'm really proud of them and it was very difficult to write. Were you disappointed that the final January 6th report didn't go deeper into those intelligence failures because those failures failed you. They failed your men and women. The intelligence failures failed my men and women. The, the uh, Department of Defense failures failed my men and women. They didn't go into it. They didn't address it. The um, Inspector General for the Department of Homeland Security, they acknowledged that there was failures, but doesn't seem to be holding anybody accountable. How do we know that's not gonna happen again? You know, the failures there with intelligence, the failures with the uh, Department of Defense, while my men and women were out there fighting, we could have prevented that. Why do you think you were so unprepared that day? We were so unprepared. You know, when you look back and the research I've put into this book, the amount of work that, that's in it and all the intelligence you see, you know, I, I strike it up to really three things. Security on the Hill is so politicized. You know, I'm the only police chief in the United States of America that has a federal law that prevents me from bringing in resources in advance or while we're under attack without getting approval of the uh, Capitol Police Board. And if I'm gonna do it in advance, they have to get leadership approval. Think about that. That created a 71 minute delay while my men and women were fighting on the west front of the Capitol, waiting for approval from the Capitol Police Board just for me to call in federal, um, federal resources. When, when the police department's overwhelmed and we dial 911, we call the National Guard. And when I called the National Guard, they didn't come. What did they say? The, the National Guard, so, when I finally got approval at 234, I had to get on a phone call with the Pentagon and beg and plead. I'm watching the TV. I'm watching my men and women. You're fight. watching your men and women get brutally attacked. You pick up the phone and call the National Guard and what happens? They're watching the same thing I'm watching. They have main screen, they have TVs in every office in the Pentagon, watching the same thing that's going on, watching my men and women get beaten and I'm begging and pleading. You can talk. The mayor even said it. The chief of police from, um, for Metropolitan Police Department said he was begging for, for help. They didn't want to send National Guard anywhere. I want you to tell me what words did they say to you on the other end of the phone? So I'm talking, and it was Lieutenant General Piat. He says he's worried, quote, about the optics. He was worried about the look of the National Guard 
on the grounds of the of the um, Capitol. What about the look that we're looking at our screen right now of people who are trying to beat to death your men and women and potentially our members of Congress and our vice president? Do you think that's a better look? I would much rather have military uh, up on up on the grounds. I'm begging and pleading, literally begging for assistance for my men and women. They're not sending them. I have to wait three and a half hours. You know, I do the research in the book. You know what I find? I find this. I find a document from the Secretary of Defense restricting the National Guard from even carrying uh, any type of chemical munitions, any kind of munitions for civil disobedience, any kind of protective gear, any kind of helmets, shields, for the very violence they expected to come on January 6th. Millie and Miller had talked about it. They had talked about it in... Um, Conference calls, talked about tra locking down the city, talked about revoking permits. You know who issues permits on, on Capitol grounds? I do. You know who they didn't tell about that violence? Me. They, they could have told me we could have helped prevent this. My men and women didn't have to go through that. Did anyone apologize to you? Because let's be honest, they all knew better. They don't need to apologize to me. They need to apologize to my men and women. Oh, my goodness. Um, given all of that, have any of these rules and regulations changed in the last two years? If we, if our capital was attacked tomorrow, would anything be different? They've changed one rule. The rule that prevented me from calling in federal resources during a, a, an attack, so why we're under attack like we're on January 6th, was changed in December with the United States Capitol Police, I think it's the Emergency Amendment Act of December 2021. It gave the Chief of Police the ability to call in federal resources without having to go to the three politically appointed people in the Capitol Police Board, the voting members of the board, to get their approval. So he can call it in. But you know what they did? They made it revocable. So if the leadership says, you know what, we don't like the quote, the look, the optics of the National Guard on the Hill, we can revoke it. But if, like, when I went and asked for the National Guard on January 3rd, they still have to go through that process. I, 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 to, to hear you say this is just painful and shocking. Then how does it make you feel that now Capitol tour guides who are giving tourists and, and class trips a tour of the Capitol, they don't mention what happened on January 6th. Good or bad, it is a part of U.S. history. It, it is a part of U.S. history, and I know... I was just talking with the Capitol Police officer shortly before I came in here, and they were explaining a lot of times when people come in, they'll ask them about January 6th, and, and these officers are still so traumatized, and it's just not Capitol Police officers. I've talked to hardened metropolitan police officers who have said they thought they were going to die that day, um, and they people still are traumatized have... traumatized just from watching. And they have difficulty talking about it, so it, it doesn't shock me. You know, it's again, there's a, you know, just so much political theater down on uh, uh, Capitol Hill. It's all politics. I'm so grateful you wrote this book. I'm, I'm thankful for the work that you've done in protecting so many people. And thanks for being here today. Thank you for being here. Thank, Thank for having you. Me. The last thing before we go tonight, C-SPAN gone wild. It's the best season of C-SPAN ever, tweeted Jon Stewart. C-SPAN is America's hottest TV drama in 2023, says The Hollywood Reporter. And New York Magazine writes this, a house without rules makes for C-SPAN gone wild. Who needs Sports Center or sitcoms when you can watch Kevin McCarthy step on the same rake time and again? The fight over speaker has allowed outside cameras to be used on C-SPAN for longer than is normally allowed. C-SPAN's director of editorial operations explained to The Hollywood Reporter this. Most of the time that you see the House of Representatives on C-SPAN, it's actually being shot by government employees with government cameras, and they have fairly stringent guidelines under which they have to operate. So without those guidelines, we are getting some very special access to what is actually happening in the House. Like Jim Jordan huddling with Kevin McCarthy after Jordan was unwillingly nominated for speaker. Notable outcast George Santos sitting all alone in the chamber. And don't you wish you could hear the conversation between odd couples like Matt Gates and Pramila Jayapal or Paul Gosar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Well... Twitter's bad lip reading, they got you covered on this one. You dreamt of Dracula? Mm -hmm. While well, we're on this sort of stuff, hey. you heard of the Pied Piper? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in my dream, Pied Piper had toilet paper, one sheet mm -hmm. of the cheap kind. Yes. And he took that and he ripped out a creme brulee and a little mm -hmm. tiny pepper uh -huh. yes. before mm -hmm. he ate mm -hmm. a tree. 
You didn't have that dream? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, nope. Okay, you did not. Don't tell me you did. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't ever get to mm -hmm. dream of the Pied Piper eating mm -hmm. a tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you're telling me mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. dreamed that too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I... I uh, then it wasn't as cool as my dream. Some very, very bad lip reading takes us off the air tonight.